Keep before your eyes, day by day, death and exile and everything that seems terrible, but most of all death, and then you will never have any abject thought, nor will you yearn for anything beyond measure. In chapter 21, Epictetus is suggesting to us an old Stoic practice, one that's not confined solely to the Stoics, but which they made uh, considerable use of, which is uh, bringing before the eyes, or what we nowadays call visualization. You notice that visualization basically means the same thing. We're talking about vision. Vision is through your eyes, bringing something before your eyes. So what are we supposed to visualize? And how is this supposed to benefit us? He talks about visualizing things that we tend to view uh, as a culture and as individuals as terrible things, as calamities. So he says, um, keep before your eyes day by day death and exile, fuge. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And everything that seems terrible, but most of all death. And then you will never have any abject thought, nor will you earn for anything beyond measure. Now, this is a very short passage, but it's very rich, and there's a lot to unpack here. So death itself. Notice the, the emphasis that he gives to that. Death ends the whole show for us, right? There's nothing more happening. There's, there's no more choosing. There's no more working upon yourself. There's no more feeling good. There's no more feeling bad after death comes. And so if we remind ourselves of what later philosophers have called the finitude of human existence, that is going to really help us put matters into perspective. Epictetus has a really interesting passage in the discourses where he says, you know, if, if I find out that I'm going to die, this is roughly paraphrasing, I would just keep on doing what I'm doing because yeah, I should be doing this anyway, right? If, if you, you know, somebody comes to you and says, oh, you're going to die tomorrow, and then suddenly you totally change your life, that's a sign that your life has been mislived and poorly oriented and badly prioritized up until that point. Sometimes people really need uh, a near-death ex experience or the, you know, um, clear horizon being set, you've got six months to live, in order for this to kick in. The Stoics thought that we ought to engage in, you know, thinking about death, you know, uh, in, in visualizing what could happen or what inevitably will happen uh, throughout our life, and that it's not done for a morbid purpose, it's not done to make us feel bad, it's actually done in order to liberate us by allowing us to see what's, what really matters and what's kind of trivial. You know, uh, you see him giving lots of examples of not being too upset when, for example, a child or a spouse dies, <clears throat> but another way of looking at this is that it's to recognize the finitude, the, how valuable the time that we actually do have together is, and that we should try to avoid screwing it up with all of our worries and conflicts and concerns and all of that sort of business. So keep before your eyes day by day. Now notice what he's saying there, day by day. It's not something that you do once and for all and then never think about it. It's something that you do as a daily practice. Um, you could do this in the morning. You could do this at night. You could think to yourself, well, uh, how was the day? This might be the last one I get. I might not wake up from this. And, and not doing that in any sort of uh, maudlin way, but recognizing that that's, that's actually the case. Now, he talks also about exile, uh, fuge. And exile was something that Epictetus knew something about. He himself had to go into exile because when he was teaching as a philosopher in Rome, the Roman emperor at the time decided, hey, these philosophers have to go. I'm kicking them out. He, re re he relocated not somewhere else in Italy, but all the way back to uh, the Greek-speaking world, which is where uh, Arian wrote down these, these discourses that, that form the Enchiridion. 
So he knew something about having to leave it all behind. You know, when, when you have to go into exile, you're not going to get top dollar for your stuff. You're going to leave sometimes with just the proverbial shirt on your back and hopefully some sandals on your feet. And if you're lucky, some food in the bag. And that means that you become dependent upon other people. If you don't have family uh, or friends, then upon strangers and whether they'll help you out or not. Um, you know, refugees are an example of people who are forced into exile. You know, we have many refugees in our world today, and you see the sorts of travails that they go through. Uh, people don't choose to become refugees uh, very lightly. It has to get quite bad for them to say, I'm, I'm leaving here. Sometimes their homes are destroyed. Sometimes their families have been decimated. Sometimes they're being threatened with uh, torture and rape and then murder after that. So this is a terrible thing. This is something that, you know, we can look at and say, uh, nobody should have that inflicted upon them. Uh, and then we can wonder about how we would ourselves deal with that sort of situation. How would we deal uh, with other things that, as Epictetus says, um, seem terrible, right? Dana in Greek, fearsome. The things that provoke a great amount of fear in us. Not just things that provoke uh, a certain amount of fear, phobos, but the things that seem like they would destroy our world. What else would fit into this category? Well, for some people, losing their job. You know, many people here in, in our country, in America, are, as, as economists have shown, effectively two paychecks away from losing <clears throat> much of what they have. Not being able to make house payments, not being able to make car payments, not being able to pay the bills, not being able to pay debts that they, they have. And so, it, you know, we live in fairly precarious times. Uh, and these are times that are more similar to what it was like back in ancient Greece and Rome, I think, for many people. Um, relationships. Oftentimes people feel that if a certain relationship is to founder, or God forbid that person should pull their affection away, like the entire world would fall apart. Other people see social uh, status as, as a, a, a good that is intensely vulnerable in that way. What if people find out that I'm not really, this is what's called the imposter syndrome, what if people find out that I'm not really what I pretend to be? You know, I'm not as competent. Uh, will, they, will they take my position away? Will people look at me differently? What if people find out that I don't know as much as I, I claim to know or even just people think that I know? What if people find out I'm not a great musician, I'm not a great athlete? It would go on and on and on and on. And it's often very successful people, people who have lots of talents who suffer from this imposter syndrome. These are worries that people have. So one way of dealing with this is to, like Epictetus says, visualize for yourself what's the worst that could happen. And then along with this, what could I do if that happens to me? So what is indeed the worst that could happen with respect to a relationship, with respect to somebody who you love dying, with respect to the election coming up, with respect, many people are getting very worked up about that, uh, with respect to your professional career. What, are, are, uh, what, what is the worst that could happen if you get an F in a class? Visualize these things daily, and then if they happen, which they probably won't, you're going to actually be equipped. You'll have things in perspective and be able to handle them. You'll have more emotional resiliency, as they say. And he says, you'll never have any abject thought, nor will you yearn for anything beyond measure. Um, you're, you're not going to have these, these dejected, depressive thoughts uh, or panicking that don't allow people to deal with the, the things that happen to them. But it's also going to help you to maintain perspective about what really is worth desiring or being averse to, what is worth choosing and pursuing, and what is worth uh, choosing against and, and trying to reject away from yourself. All of this can be a very helpful um, daily practice to do, and this is indeed what many Stoics have done and still do today.
If you yearn for philosophy, prepare at once to be met with ridicule, to have many people jeer at you and say, here he is again, turned philosopher all of a sudden. And where do you suppose he got that high brow? But do you not put on a high brow, and do you so hold fast to the things which to you seem best, as a man who has been assigned by God to this post? And remember that if you abide by the same principles, those who formerly used to laugh at you will later come to admire you. But if you are worsted by them, you will get the laugh on yourself twice. This chapter, number 22, is kind of near and dear to my heart because it it reminds me of, you know, when I first started studying philosophy, and did not follow Epictetus' advice. And I've seen many other people uh, do this as well. Now, Epictetus says, if you yearn for philosophy, if if that's what you desire, epithumes, if if you have a a hankering, an appetite for philosophy, prepare at once to be met with ridicule. And that is probably just as true in our day as it was in Epictetus' day, um, it's kind of funny because you know a lot of people will idealize certain time periods as if those were you know when everybody was an intellectual and and you know thought studying philosophy was cool. Um, philosophy has never really been cool. It's always been something that some people have had negative things to say about, and it, like he says, ridicule. And he's got this very long, long word here. Kata galas theisomenos, right? Uh, Greek is great for being able to compose words, and Epictetus throws out a doozy right there. It means something like, not just people are going to you know, snicker at you, they're going to really make fun of you. They're going to say, look at that guy who's doing philosophy, or look at that girl who thinks she's so smart. This is common. This is something that Socrates faced, If you read some of the Platonic dialogues, you will see younger people saying to Socrates, what the hell's wrong with you? You know, philosophy, that sort of stuff is fine for kids. But once you become a grown man, now you got to get serious about stuff. Find yourself a profession. Get into politics. Do something that's real, not this airy nonsense, you know, with your head up in the clouds. Um... People have been saying this sort of thing for a long time. Even the people who who sometimes uh, claim that they're interested in philosophy or that they respect it may often harbor a kind of, you know, secret envy or resentment or any of those sort of things. And it's easy to to laugh at people. So he says, um, be prepared to have many people jeer at you and say, here he is again, turned philosopher all of a sudden, you know. And it makes sense if you're just starting out, you're making a change in your life. It's this way not just with philosophy, but with any sort of important life conversion. So, you know, you go on a diet and people are like, oh, yeah, you're going to lose weight? Yeah, well, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, you have some sort of religious conversion or a conversion away from religion and people are like, yeah, that's not really going to stick. Uh, you think all that stuff right now. Even relationships, you know, you get involved with somebody romantically and people are like, oh, yeah, look at this guy. Now he's a poet. He's in love. You know, give it a couple weeks. You know, and the people are always going to be cynical, at least a certain proportion of them. And why shouldn't they be? I mean, we've seen plenty of people who jump into things and they don't really stick with it. That is a common human experience, one that we ourselves have had, one that we've seen many other people have. Lots of people say they're going to study philosophy. How many of them actually do stick with it? You can find this out by looking at uh, YouTube video playlists. First video in the playlist of some philosophy thing, you know, hundreds of thousands of views. It tapers off after that. Maybe you get down to the last video in the playlist and there's only a thousand views. That means that a thousand people actually stuck with that video series. That's not yet even like doing philosophy. That's just hearing somebody else talk about philosophy and maybe thinking about it yourself. But a hundred thousand people 
petered out along the way. It's like that with, with anything that requires real uh, persistence. So he says, um, where do you suppose he got that high brow? You know, the, when we talk about high brow, we're talking about, you know, we're, in other words, where is that egghead coming from? Oh, your head is so stuffed with knowledge, right? And Epictetus says, don't put on a high brow. Don't, don't put on airs that you're smarter than anyone else when you first start out doing Stoic philosophy. You're probably going to have a hell of a time with confusions saying, oh, I'm so badly off. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I keep on failing, and, and I don't even understand these passages here, uh, you know, and I, I'm looking at this to try to help me, and I mean, I'm laughing a little bit at this, but I'm laughing at my, my own experiences with this myself, because I, I've gone through that, uh, not just with Stoic philosophy, but with a, a few others. Um, it's tough. It's, it's difficult. And so don't set your, yourself up for the kinds of, you know, ridicule that you'll come in for, which might lead you to failure if you're not already well situated at the beginning. You've got to, in certain ways, take it easy on yourself uh, by not presenting a, a target for ridicule to other people. So he says, do you so hold fast to the things which to you seem best? As a man who has been assigned by God to this post. And remember that if you abide by the same principles, something's going to happen. Now, this abiding by these principles, this being assigned by God to the post, that is coming from the, the, the God to the post thing is Socrates, right? Socrates is a great ideal for, for the Stoics in general and especially for Epictetus. Socrates thought that doing philosophy, and he wasn't just teaching philosophy, he was doing philosophy he was engaged in inquiry, was something that was a mission from God, that he had been assigned this mission. The way in which he arrived at that's a little bit, you know, strange, um, but, you know, that, that's a whole different conversation. If you're going to be doing philosophy, according to Epictetus, that's something that's coming from whatever you want to call it, the transcendent, right? And stick with it. Act as if that's been your assignment, your duty, that's, you're on the roster, right? And he says, hold fast to the things which you, to seem, to you seem best. If it seems like you, to, if it seems best to you that putting stoic philosophy into practice, that trying it out is really good for you, do it. You don't have to talk about it with other people. You don't have to make a show of it. You definitely don't have to grow a philosopher's beard. Uh, that was kind of a common thing back then. Uh, or dress in a certain way. You don't have to have any philosophy swag these days, like a ball cap or a t-shirt. I love Epictetus, you know, any, any of that sort of stuff. Um, you don't have to, you know, try to look profound and carrying around a book all the time of Epictetus. Those are just externals. It's in here and in here that, you know, your philosophy is gradually being digested being assimilated, being made part of, as Epictetus says, your sinews and your muscles. So do that. And then what, what will happen afterwards? He says, if you abide by these same principles, those who formerly used to laugh at you will later come to admire you. If you can stick with it, then you can be a philosopher. But you have to stick with it. If you don't stick with it, if you do it halfway, if you do it just on weekends, if you do it only when somebody's watching, then it's never really going to become part of who you are, and you're going to fail at it. I mean, you're going to fail anyway to some degree, but you're going to fail in ways that make other people look at you and say, ah, ha, ha, silly philosopher. That's what philosophy is. It's that stupid stuff that that guy does. He says, if you... Um, uh, are worsted by the, these, you know, principles and, and these people, you will get the laugh on yourself twice. If you're going to do philosophy, do it in a non-showy way and stick with it. And, you know, by the time that people start saying, oh, hey, you really are, are doing philosophy well, uh, this is something I find attractive, you're probably not even going to care that much about what other people think, because the Stoic philosophy will be working for you. So this is some great advice. 
And I think this is great advice not only for anybody who wants to practice Stoic philosophy, but for anybody who wants to get into philosophy in general. If it should ever happen to you that you turn to externals with a view to pleasing someone, rest assured that you have lost your plan of life. Be content, therefore, in everything to be a philosopher. And if you wish also to be taken for one, show to yourself that you are one, and you will be able to accomplish it. Chapter 23 also has a nice observation about doing philosophy and being taken for a philosopher, but this applies to just about anything else that we want to be serious about. He says, if it should ever happen to you that you turn to externals with a view to pleasing someone, rest assured you have lost your plan of life. Now, unless you, maybe your plan of life was to try to please people or to, you know, focus on externals. But that's a self-defeating way of approaching things, according to the Stoics. Anytime that you are placing yourself and your thoughts, your opinions, your feelings, your desires, your aversions into the hands of another, you're taking a huge risk. Now, even if they are good people that you're doing this with, they can screw up. They can, they can mistake what's going on. You can end up being hurt. And if you do end up being hurt, you're the one who placed all that in the hands of another. If, if it's about, you know, the more, con, you know, common situations where you're trying to win approval or you're trying to, as, you know, we say these days, be a people pleaser, um, in, in many cases, you can never get that. Or what you're going to get is going to be so much less than what you are actually desiring that you're just not going to be happy with it, or it'll come at the wrong time. We can go on and on and on with all sorts of modalities of this. But now notice what he's connecting together here. Two different things. He's talking about um, external things, the, the exo, right? And now he's also talking about pleasing other people, with having that literally as your, your plan, what it is that you're, you're intending, you know. Prosta bulasai arasai tini, you know, uh, with the, the intention in, in mind of making somebody else happy about it or pleasing them, gratifying them would be another way of saying it. If you're doing this, you're putting, you're putting things at risk in two different ways. External things by themselves are by their nature um, not subject to our, our power. And so you may have all sorts of desires, hopes, fears, choices about them, but you can't make them go your way. Other people who actually technically are speaking, you know, technically speaking, are in the class of external things, but here we're thinking about like property or reputation. Other people, other people who can make choices, other people who are free, other people who have their own motivational structures, their own desires, their own opinions, their own thoughts, also out of your control. Now you're mixing together two things that are totally out of your control. So let's say you actually do manage to succeed with the external thing. You make a ton of money because you're trying to please your dad who always said that you were never going to be a success, right? So you do make a ton of money. You succeed in that. Odds are, you know, most people won't do that, but you do it. Your dad can still say, Oh, yeah, you made a ton of money. You're still a failure. I, 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 I'm not going to give you my approval. You can get the best grades. And the school can turn you down and say, Oh, we're not really interested in somebody with your life experiences. You can win a prize. You can get the top position in something. You can write the best book in the world. And the people whose approval you care about can still say, eh, I'm not interested. Don't really care. You're still a loser. You know, if you are going to place your eggs into this basket, it's really um, a bad choice. It's really dangerous. There's no way in which you can possibly make sure that things are going to go your way, the way that you want them to go. And so he says, be assured you have lost your plan of life. You have, in, in another way of saying it, you've actually destroyed apolesis, pain, and, and stasi, the, the, you know, the way in which you've structured things.
Now, he's talking about Stoic philosophy there and the fact that we cannot invest ourselves in trying to succeed in external ways to please other people because we're, we're just, you know, setting ourselves up for failure and we're not going to concentrate on the things that are within us. We're not going to concentrate on our own structure of desire and whether it's screwed up or whether it's on track. We're not going to examine our thoughts and beliefs and opinions to see whether they're nuts or partly nuts or semi-rational or on the way to being rational. I mean, here's, here's something you can take for granted. Whatever assemblage of thoughts you've got in your head at any given time, some of them are not rational yet. I mean, that's that's uh, sort of a, a basic <laughs> for the Stoic uh, uh, practice. They may seem rational, and the process of following them out is a rational process, but you can have all sorts of irrational assumptions. Now, if you're focused on, you know, succeeding in external things so you can please these people, you're not going to focus on that. As a matter of fact, in order to, to, to get those things, you might have to put into your head all sorts of irrational thoughts that allow you to have the motivation to go out there and make a million bucks or to win political office or to you know, uh, write, write a, a book that somehow you know, ends up be, being on the bestseller list or doing this or doing this or doing this. But it's not good overall, even though that seems to be an external good, it's not good for you to have false thoughts in your head, to have irrational thought processes. So he goes on and he says, how do we apply this to philosophy? Be content, therefore, in everything to be a philosopher, to be a philosopher. And if you wish also to be taken for one, show to yourself that you are one and you will be able to accomplish it. If you want other people to... to recognize how smart a person you are, how well put together you are, how, you know, uh, straight, straight and narrow your life is, or how rich it is, or how you're just, you know, great in all these ways. First, you actually have to convince yourself of that. And this is a, another good point. It's a little bit of a digression. Why do we try to please others so much? It's because we're not pleased with ourselves. We, we want that approval from other people for whatever ex external achievements or you know, goods or, or resources we're able to provide them. Give them a lot of gifts, right? Oh, they're going to love me if I give them gifts. No, they might despise you and, and think that you're kind of a patsy for giving them gifts. You don't control any of this. You do control what's here. If you want to be a philosopher in the sense of somebody who practices Stoic philosophy, that is up to you. It's going to take some work. You can't snap your fingers and automatically do it. Because it, it, trust me, if you could, I would have done it years ago. But you can work at it. And you can get yourself to the point where you can recognize the progress that you're making. And then you're no longer dependent on those other people out there. And you see there's kind of a self-reinforcement here. That's what Stoic philosophy is about. That's what it's teaching us as a good thing, not being dependent upon other people, not being hindered by them, not being negatively affected by them, being who we are and working upon ourselves. So like he says, be a philosopher. Don't worry about whether other people think you're a philosopher or if you're going to, worry about what this person thinks, who you, what you think about yourself. And if you can convince yourself, then let them know that you're a philosopher. But until then, keep it under wraps.